Welcome to what I like to call the greatest lost and found department humanity has ever known. And you're like, what are you talking about? How many of you were lost but are now found by the grace of God? <laughs> Amen? Listen, I believe church is meant to be enjoyed, not just endured. And so this morning, I want to have a good time with you guys. I'm excited. I really am excited and privileged uh, by the opportunity uh, I've been given to share the word this morning. It's, it's back to church Sunday. Uh, it's the one Sunday out of the year we invite our friends. Well, not the one Sunday, but one of the Sundays out of the year we invite our friends. Hey, come to church with us. So we're excited. If you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, as Joe said, my name is Ernie. I get to serve here as the associate pastor on staff. And uh, once in a while, they, uh, they grant me the opportunity to share the word. And um, today is one of those days. So again, welcome. Hey, listen. Uh, I know a lot of you guys in here, and I think, uh, for the most part, we have pretty good relationships, I'd say, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're cool. We get along pretty well. Well, I am potentially about to kind of sever those relationships, not on purpose. Um, and for those of you guys who are new, I like to get off on the right foot when I meet new people. Like, I like to make friends pretty fast. And uh, today, that might not happen for me. Based on what I'm about to share with you, I am about to share uh, something of a fact with you guys. It's something uh, that you guys tend to hold on to, to the point where it's stripped out of your hands. This Thursday, September 21st, summer is officially over. <laughs> Let it go, people. It's over. I love summer too. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoy the summer. As a matter of fact, it's my favorite, it's my favorite season, but it's over. Some of you guys are still holding on to it for dear life. And even the weather's like, hey, it's still summer. No, it's not. <laughs> Stop it. Have you seen the trees? They're starting to lose their leaves. Summer's over. For the most part, it's, it's over. And you know what that means for me? My favorite thing to do every year is to go on vacation. And about two weeks ago, Pilar and I came back from Florida, and when we, when we got on the plane to get back home, I said, goodbye till next year, vacation. I love vacation. How many of you guys enjoy vacationing? Yeah, it's a great time. Whether you vacation or you staycation, it's nice to just, like, kind of hang out and veg out a little bit, isn't it? It's nice. It really is. I love vacations. I love uh, going to theme parks this past year. Pilar got to go to Epcot or Disney for the first time. Pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. It was great. I love, I love vacations. I love hanging out by the beach and by the pool and just kind of relaxing. And I, I love vacation. One of, one of my fondest memories of vacation was uh, my parents would often take us away to little islands or whatever. And we would rent bikes on the island and we'd ride around the island together. And I remember one year in particular, my dad made the foolish decision to rent a four-person bicycle. <laughs> a four-person bicycle. It was me Emily, my mom and my dad, uh, Emily was too young to reach the pedal, so she couldn't pedal, and my mom got lazy after about the third pace and stopped pedaling. So it was really me and my dad carrying Emily and my mom and, and myself, and it was, it, was, uh, it was a rough day to say the least, uh, I'll tell you that much. I think we stopped for water about 4,000 times on that ride and went about 100 feet. But, uh, but I love, I love vacations. Vacations are great, aren't they? They really are. When I, think about, when I think about vacation, I think the primary reason we take vacations or we take staycations is to what? We need a, we need a rest. We need, we need a break at some point or another. And that's because the, the constant mundane activities of this life can get a little, a little exhausting. It's almost like you hit the play button and you just go automatically throughout your day and it gets tiring after a while, doesn't it? Not to mention the, the kind of sudden, rigorous things that, that come up that exhaust us immediately. We find ourselves weary, physically tired. You know, I, I remember vacation vividly when I was a young man. Um, I, I remember one year for vacation, my parents took us to uh, Puerto Rico. It wasn't summertime, though. It was for Thanksgiving. And uh, we got to spend Thanksgiving with my grandfather and my grandmother. And, 
and it was my sister, my dad, my mom and I, and um, it, it was a great time. We really did have a good time celebrating Thanksgiving with my grandparents. We, um, my grandmother invited all her friends over the house. It was like the town party, and uh, Oh, it was such a great time, it really was. We got to tour the island, visit family on the other side of the island, and um, one of our favorite things about Puerto Rico is uh, there's beaches all over, and, and one day we went to a beach, probably several days we went to the beach, but this is the day I remember the most. And uh, we spent most of the day in the water, playing on the sand and just relaxing, and then at one point my father and my grandfather, who's since gone home to be with the Lord, but I'll never forget this, um, my, my father and my grandfather said, ah, let's go for a walk, and they took me with them. And I was excited because in Puerto Rico, as you walk uh, on the beach, you can pick up little hermit crabs. And it was fun. I had a bunch of pets while I was on vacation. It was really cool. And, uh, and so we went up, um, we went for this walk up this little mountain off by the beach, my father, grandfather, and I. And um, it was a, it's a beautiful little mountain. It's like a little park off the side of the beach. And it's tree-lined with these gorgeous, luscious green trees. And one of the trees that's very common in Puerto Rico is the coconut tree. It's the coconut tree. And, uh, and I remember kind of vividly my grandfather and father saying, man, wouldn't one of those coconuts be really good right now? Very refreshing to drink. And, and so my father's like, yeah, let's, let's, let's get a coconut. And my grandfather, who was very innovative, he could make something out of nothing. He was pretty amazing uh, the way he would do that. He says, well, we have nothing, but let me look around. And he looks around, and he's, he's kind of looking around, and he, he, uh, he sees on the ground this, this pipe. All right, this isn't really a pipe, guys. Bear with me. This is an illustration. All right? So you guys know um, chain link fences, right? You've seen a chain link fence before? Okay, imagine the cross piece, the piece that goes across, it's about 10 feet or so long, I would say, I think, I don't know. But it, it was a long piece of pipe that my grandfather found. I'd assume somebody had left it there having gotten coconuts for themselves. And, and uh, my grandfather brings it over to my dad and says, uh, says here you go, you, you go for it. You remember this, dad? <laughs> and, uh, and so my father proceeds to hold the pole at the very end and start try to knock down the coconut. And he's eyeing this one coconut in particular. I don't know why, but he just fixates on stuff. That's my dad. So, 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 so he, he goes to... And, and he either missed or, or he would hit it and it would just kind of like wobble on the tree several times. You, know, you got to have leverage to do these things and miss. And eventually at like 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, however old I was, eventually, eventually I got a little bored, just to be honest with you. I got a little bored. And I went to my dad, and I'm like, Dad, I want to go. I'm bored. My dad just stands there. <laughs> Ernie, get out of the way. I'm standing in front of my dad. Dad, I'm bored. Get out of the way. Ernie, get out of the way. And eventually, I guess my dad got a little tired. I was standing in front of my dad, and the pole went, miss, ooh, blink. I was out. I woke up on the flat of my back, and it was amazing not to see faces of distress, but to see faces of joy and laughter <laughs> when I woke up. And if I'm not mistaken, they were probably even sipping the coconut that fell to the ground. <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys are laughing. I was in pain that day. You know, the, the weariness we feel is, is far more than a spiritual condition. We, we kind of need a break, don't we, at some point or another. It, it, it stems often from an emotional or spiritual condition. I mean, think about it. For some of us, we live in a perpetual state of weariness. A, a perpetual state where we say, we need rest. We need rest. I need rest. I need to get a break. It's much deeper than a physical thing. I mean, I think about it in, in a room this big, guaranteed, if not all of us, then at least some of us have walked in here and said, I am tired. Physically, emotionally, spiritually tired. And each day we seek a little bit of rest like we, we, we say we need a break and instead what we get is hitting the head with a pipe. At least that's what it feels like, doesn't it? 
Each day we seek rest. And it feels like we get hit. Our marriage and our family situation is a struggle to say the least. Our work situations or a lack thereof, that's tough, isn't it? Leaves us weary. Uh, financially, we find ourselves just, just getting by and we're weary, we're tired. And to top it off, it's like with all these stressors that we already have to, to deal with, now we get sick. Just can't deal with it. It's too much. For some of us, we've walked in here and our life circumstances have us weary. Have us exhausted. For some of us, we've walked in here and we'd, we'd say, hey, I'm tired as a, on account that people have failed me. The people closest to me have let me down. My, my, my parents, my, my family, my, my kids, the, the, the people I've esteemed. Uh, maybe for you, it's a spouse who's let you down. Your self-help rest methods just don't work. It just leaves you even more weary. How many of you guys have heard the scripture, God helps those who help themselves? It's not in there. It's not in there. And you're weary on account of trying and trying and trying to fight this, this weariness and can't do it. When all you need is rest, you can't seem to find it anywhere. And then you say to yourself, you know what? Maybe I need God. I'm going to go to church. You walk into the doors of a church where you're, I'm sorry, guys. It's true, though, isn't it? In Jesus' day, that's, uh, he addresses that to a crowd. But listen to what Eugene Peterson says. I really appreciate this because it brings to light what the church is all about. You're right, sometimes we do get hit with a pipe when we walk into the four doors of a church, but so much more than that. Listen to this. St. Paul talked about the foolishness of preaching. I would like to talk about the foolishness of congregation, God's choice of venue. Of all the ways in which to carry out the enterprise of the church, this has, has, to, be, has to be the most absurd. A haphazard collection of people who somehow get assembled into pews on Sundays, half-heartedly sing a few songs, most of them they don't like, and tune in and out of a sermon according to their state of digestion and the preacher's decibels. Sorry for yelling. My apologies. They're awkward in their commitments and jerky in their patterns. But listen to this. Here's the flip side of it. We're not perfect here. I can admit that. But the people in those pews are also the people who suffer deeply and find God in their suffering. They make love commitments, are faithful to them through trial and temptation and bear fruits of righteousness, spirit fruits that bless the people around them. Babies surrounded by hopeful and rejoicing parents and friends are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The dead are offered up to God in funerals that, in the midst of tears and grief, give solemn and joyful witness to the resurrection. Sinners repent and take the body and blood of Jesus and receive new life. The truth is that these two realities are mixed in the church. They're impossible to separate. I want to share a message this morning that I've entitled, Welcome Home. Welcome Home. And if I were to bottom line this message, you have notes in your bulletins. If I were to bottom line this message, it would be simple. I want to invite all of us, really, at some point, to come to Jesus where we'll find lasting, eternal rest for our souls. I'm going to read the scripture and then we're going to say a word of prayer. But Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. He says, come to me, all you who labor. Now, I am in seminary right now, and I am taking Greek. So at some point, at every message I preach, Greek is going to come out. Just fair warning. And so I had to look up this word, labor. And labor carries with it that word labor is more than just work or toil like I thought it was initially. When Jesus uses the word labor or kopion in the Greek, it literally means to... Be weary from having been beaten. To, to have taken a beating and as a result of it, you're, you're weary. 
You don't have to answer this question, but how many of you have walked in here having taken a beating? Weary on account of life's circumstances, on account of the stuff of this life, on account of the people you've trusted who've let you down, and, and you're weary. He says, come to me, all you who have taken a beating <laughs> and are heavy laden, and I, this is a promise, I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest lasting rest, eternal rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We learn in verse 7 that, you know what, I'm sorry, let's pray. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We do thank you for the opportunity that you give us to join together in celebration on this day, on this Back to Church Sunday. God, I thank you for visitors, God. I thank you for the people who have decided to join us this morning. We pray that they would be blessed, Lord. We pray that each person who's in this room would not leave here the same, but would leave here changed for all eternity. We thank you, Lord, that it's in you where we find our rest. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I, when I look at the scripture in, in verse 7 of this, of this chapter, chapter 11, it tells us that Jesus was addressing a crowd. Now, the crowd, we know this for sure, wasn't all important people. There were probably some there. They weren't all popular people. I'm sure there were popular people there. There weren't all prominent people there. There weren't all people who agreed with Jesus. There were probably a mix of maybe priests or Pharisees or scribes. And then, and then there were the common people who I believe Jesus was, a, was addressing here. And I often like to liken myself to the common person. You see, when we look at the what, the highly religious and political groups of that day, the scribes and the Pharisees, would often set laws by which people were to abide. The common people, that is, were to abide. There were laws that dictated things like who you could marry, what you could eat, what you could grow for crop. Imagine that, I'm trying to make a living and you're dictating what I could, I could use for business. You're dictating what I could eat around the dinner. You're dictating who I could marry. When I could rest, how you're to pray? Scribes and Pharisees had come up with a total of 613 laws to follow. Wow. Imagine that. Imagine the weight of trying to fulfill each one of those traditions really is what they were. It must have been heavy. It's impossible. You're right. Matthew chapter 23, verses 2 to 4, Jesus says this. The teacher of the religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. They don't practice what they teach. In fact, Jesus says, listen to this, verse 4, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. And so when Jesus says, come to me, all you who have been beaten, all you who are heavy laden. I believe Jesus was talking to those who were crushed, those who were disenfranchised, the marginalized, the people who were excluded, the people who were hurting, the people who had been beaten, people who had been burnt by so-called religious people. People who were spiritually, emotionally, physically drained, they were done. They couldn't do it anymore. People who were hopeless and desperate, and his claim is, come to me, and I'll give you rest. You see, the Pharisees' favorite word was, do or don't. Do this, don't do that. Jesus' response was, come. You know what that tells me? There's a simple principle in there. I believe that before we're expected to behave like Jesus, we belong to Jesus. Jesus says, come. The invitation was open to those who were exhausted and burdened. I believe that invitation exists today as well. He says, come to me. It carries with it the thought that Jesus was the only one who had access to the Father and all his resources. Nobody else and nothing else. Only Jesus. And the invitation was to all those who were troubled. And that word all means what? All. Everyone. 
It's a universal invitation. Nobody who's troubled, nobody who's weary, not then and not now, is excluded from that invitation. You see, Jesus is calling anyone who's wearied with life's burdens, with the stuff of this life, to all such, he says, look, I will refresh you if you come to me. It's simple. Scripture goes on to read this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Literally, a yoke was a wooden bar that allowed two or more animals to be coupled so they might effectively work together. But yoke in the New Testament is almost always used metaphorically. And it signifies some sort of bondage or submission. You see, these people were yoked together with the law, with the weight of the law, really. These people were weary as a result. One commentator says this, the law itself was sufficient a burden, was a sufficient burden. Add to this was imposed by the traditions. Add to this what was imposed by the traditions of the Pharisees and the scribes. Hence, in general, those people laboring under a sense of sin, they just couldn't get it right. 613 laws to follow. How am I going to do it? And they were burdened. They were burdened. You see, when Jesus says, come to me, what he's saying is, come, follow me, serve me, and learn from me. You see, Jesus invites people not to be yoked to the law, but to be connected, to stay connected to him, where they'll find lasting, eternal rest for their souls. I've, uh, I've opted this morning to do things a little differently. Uh, I don't think I've done this before, maybe once, but we're going to have a couple testimonies this morning. And I'm excited about them because, uh, well, first service, they were phenomenal. But I want to talk, using these testimonies, I want to talk about three shapes rest can take in your life. I want to personalize this a little bit because I think rest looks a little different for, for everyone. You see, I believe some have walked in here feeling a little hopeless. Just like those people, they were hopeless. They couldn't get it right. Maybe for you it looks a little different. Maybe for you, life's circumstances have left you kind of upside down. Things are good for a moment, but then they're bad suddenly. There's no sense of stability in your life, and as a result, you've lost all hope. Maybe for you, it's the people around you who've failed you time and time again, leaving you weary. You put your trust in them only to be let down. But there's someone else you can put your hope in. Listen to what it says. Acts chapter 2, verse 25 to 28. This is Peter. By the way, we're going to stay in the book of Acts pretty much from here on in. Chapters 2 and 3. Pesto Wire, you'll like that. Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 28. And Peter, after the day of Pentecost, he, he starts preaching on the streets. People were amazed at what was happening. And he starts preaching on the, on the streets to these crowds. And at one point, he uses uh, the psalmist David, King David, as an illustration, something he says. And the original text can be found in Psalm 16, but I'm going to read it from the book of Acts. Listen to what it says here. David said about him, I saw the Lord before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. You see, David's joy reached beyond his present circumstances to include the hope that he would always be with God. Listen to what he says. This confirms it. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, and my body will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me. How many of you guys know he will never leave you nor forsake you? He sticks closer than a brother. He really does. At the mere mention of his name, he's there. You will not, let your, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, it says, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. You see, to come to Jesus means he himself makes himself available to us. He opens the door. He says, come to me to put your confidence in him, to put your, your trust in him. He's the only one really ultimately worthy of it anyway. He says, put your hope in me. The psalmist in Psalm 136 reminds us that God's love, over and over again actually, reminds us that God's love never, never fails us. 
Our circumstances fail us. The people around us fail us. The stuff of this life will persistently fail us. But God's love? Steadfast. C.H. Spurgeon says this, Charles Spurgeon says, Do not look to your hope, your hope, your personal, your own hope, but to Christ, who is the source of all hope. Bless you. Mike, would you help me out? So we're going we're gonna to do something a little different today. And uh, Pastor Larry, I'm going to move this stuff back real quick. And uh, we're going to... I've, um, I've opted to ask a couple of my friends to help me share the message this morning. And yeah, just leave them there, actually. It's fine. Thank you, bro. We don't need the table. The chair's fine. This is Mike. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you, bro. Hey, Mike. <laughs> yeah, so I'm excited that uh, I've, I've asked a couple of friends to, to help, help me preach this message. And um, the first person I'd like to invite up is a, is a friend who I've known for about three years now. Um, Emily, would you, would you join me? Would you guys welcome Emily? <laughs> Emily's going to share a little testimony about how she came to find hope in in Jesus, and uh, and so this morning, um, I almost tripped just now. Don't don't. You didn't see that. You didn't see that. Um, Emily, a couple questions for you. The first one is, how long have you been at MCC, and um, what does your ministry involvement look like? Okay. Um, oh yeah. Hold on a second. We need a mic. Sorry, guys. Peter, we're good. Um, so when I first started coming here, Adam invited me to come, and at first I, was, I wasn't really sure what to expect. So I walked in, and I saw everybody, and everyone was so sweet. But it wasn't until a year later when I started to come every Sunday, and I started to, my mind was open to wanting to know Jesus and wanting to just have a relationship with him. So that's when I really started coming here and meeting everyone, and I just think the fellowship here is you know, the best thing that could ever have happened to me. That's awesome. And next question, we'll jump right to it. How, mm -hmm. how have you come to find hope in Jesus? I think for a while I, I felt like I was always missing something and I felt like I was always kind of lost. Like I could never have that peace with myself. I would always, you know, talk to my dad. Like I just feel like I'm, you know, lost. I don't know what to be doing, like what I'm supposed to be doing. And then I came here, and when I started to form the relationship with God, I found hope in that, and that I'm never alone, and that God's Amen. always, always with me. Even when I'm depressed or anxious, I know that I could always turn to Him. Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Can we thank Emily? Thank you, Em. Appreciate you. Awesome. I'll have you know that Emily had notes, and she didn't use her notes. That is tremendous. Thank you, Em. That's wonderful. Um, yes, yeah, so I believe we can find, uh, you guys have those fill in the blanks there, we can find rest and hope. We can find rest and hope. If you're taking additional notes, I'd encourage you to write this down. I believe we can find hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we can find hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Those of you who have walked in here a little hopeless on account of your weariness, whatever the case might be, you can find hope in Jesus this morning. Emily, thank you for sharing. Uh, Jesus' invitation wasn't, I don't believe, just to those who were who were hopeless. I think he also invites those who were, who were hurting. Here's what I believe. And according to scripture, it's confirmed that there's also healing available in the name of Jesus Christ. If there's hope in the work of Jesus Christ, there's healing in his name. So you walked in here and your marriage isn't doing too hot. Your family is a mess. Your work is tough to say the least or your lack thereof financially you're nowhere you suffer physical illness spiritually you're far from God and you're depressed you're anxious you're hurting you're angry Jesus' invitation is to you as well 
He says, come to me. You'll find rest. I believe there's healing in the name of Jesus. You see, I remember uh, two years ago or however long it was that mom went through her cancer journey. I remember going um, downstairs with my family. We, were, we had a little prayer meeting here at the church. And it was about 15 or 20 of us. Uh, and we were inside that game area downstairs. And we were just praying and, and, and asking God for his, his, his healing in mom's life. And I'll never forget one day that the floor was given to my dad to either open us or close us in prayer. I don't remember exactly the circumstance, but um, I remember my dad, who, who generally, those of you guys who know him, generally has a lot to say. He does. He's, he's a talker. So, so, so my dad, I'm roasting my dad today. I feel so bad. But he's not here, so that's okay. So, so, uh, so my, dad, um, my dad goes to pray, and, and he can't let the words out. And all he's saying is, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And at one point, he stops and says, when we can't find the words to say, all we need to say is Jesus. Because there's healing in the name of Jesus. Because at the mention of the name of Jesus, he's right there. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 one afternoon, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those, those entering the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he stretched out his hand and he asked for money. Peter looked, at, looked directly at him as did John and they said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. What does he say? In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Taking him by the right hand, Peter helped him up at once, and, and, the, man, and the man's feet and ankles were strengthened. He sprang to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and leaping and praising God. I've asked uh, I've asked one of my favorite people, probably my favorite person in the world, really, to come and uh, share. This is my wife, Pilar, for those of you guys who don't know. Hello. <laughs> You're good. You're fine. Okay? Yeah. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Familiar, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. Pilar, why don't you tell us a little bit about how and when you came to know Jesus? Okay, so um, I grew up Catholic, and I knew who God was, and I knew who Jesus was, and <clears throat> I didn't know then that I didn't actually know hmm. who God was. Um, shortly after... Don't preach for me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just tell him. <laughs> so shortly after meeting Ernie, which was about eight years ago, um, wow. <laughs> uh, I went to one of his youth group meetings and um, I kind of felt like his message was speaking directly to me. Um, Ernie's mom prayed for me that night and um, I, that same night I actually, um, whew, sorry guys. I accepted God as my Lord and Savior that same night. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's been pretty amazing. After Pilar came to know the Lord, my mom mentored her. And since being here at MCC for the past six years, right? Yeah. For the past six years, she's had many of you guys, Kathleen and Sandy, and, and a lot of you guys uh, come alongside Pilar to mentor her. And it's amazing to see what God has done and in her life. And, you know, one of the things Pilar and I have experienced together is uh, some family stuff. You know, we, we, we saw my mom go through what we, she went through and, and, and the loss of my dad's job, remember that? And uh, Pilar and I also experienced something very early uh, or earlier in our relationship. And I've asked her to share a little bit about um, how she's experienced or witnessed, really, in this instance, God's healing in her life. Okay, so this was actually, I think, a year after. Julie okay, a year after, okay. Um, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> and yes, I've definitely witnessed God's healing hands in different ways, but I definitely have to speak about um, a very special person in my life. <laughs> 
Sorry? It's okay. <laughs> so this special person is Julie, and he's my seven-year-old nephew. <laughs> At three months old, Julian was diagnosed with a rare disease called HLH. And um, <clears throat> I guess at that point, he didn't know that for the next eight or nine months, his home will be the hospital. Huh. The little guy was, um, he looked like a tiny robot with little IVs everywhere and <clears throat> all these medications coming in and out. Um, <clears throat> but I'm sorry. During this day at the hospital, um, I kind of feel like the whole world was praying for Julian. And one night, I, I came home after visiting him. He was in Cincinnati, so that was a long drive home. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> he, I, I was praying, and I was praying to God, I think, as much as I've ever prayed like, in my life. And I said to him, Jesus, I need to know you're real. Please let me know. This is going to pass. He's going to be okay. So I opened up my Bible. I didn't even turn any pages. I opened up my Bible, and God spoke to me through Scripture. And this is what I opened the Bible to. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in sufferings of Christ, so our comfort abounds through Christ. Clearly, that was God. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I could definitely go back to my brother and my family and say, he's going to be fine, he's going to be fine. And sure enough, after chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant, Julian is a very healthy and energetic seven-year-old. <laughs> Good job. I would say energetic is an understatement, but that's okay. You know, there's healing in the name of Jesus. There really is. There really is. And your healing might not necessarily be a physical one. Maybe it's a spiritual thing that you need healing for or an emotional bondage that you're struggling with. I believe there's healing in Jesus' name. Listen to what it says in Acts chapter 3, verse 16. We're almost done. I'm going to get out your way, I promise. But listen, Acts chapter 3, verse 16, by faith, this is Peter talking, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It's in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. One thing I appreciate about this account in the book of Acts is that that beggar laid at the temple gate called Beautiful has no name. You notice that? He has no name. I used to have a, I used to be connected to a church in Florida, and the pastor would say, where there's no name, plug your name in. So for those of you who have walked in here this morning needing some sort of healing, plug your name in. It's in the name of Jesus that we find healing. If you're filling in the blanks, find rest in healing. Here's the last one. I like to do alliterations. The last one is we find ourselves at home in the body of Christ. So you can find rest in the body of Christ. You see, some of us have become so burdened by the weight of the world, by the weight of religiosity, by the hurt that we carry, by, by unforgiveness that we carry. We've literally become yoked to these things. We carry them around with us wherever we go, and we're weary, we're tired of it. But you know what? Instead of giving them to God, instead of going to, to Jesus, instead of having that come to Jesus moment, we hold on to it and we say, we're better off alone. You know what Jesus said, or God said in, in, in the creation account, right? He looked at Adam and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. We were built. We were created for community. You can find your home in the church, in the body of Christ. So what Acts 2, 2, 42 to 47 says, I'm going to kind of fly through it. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And verse 46, and day by day, they attended the temple together. They broke bread in their homes. There's something to this community thing. There's something to finding your home in the body of Christ. 
You see, loneliness is the first thing which God's eye named not good. You were built to be in community. So the sermon title is Welcome Home. I want to encourage you that you're welcomed home in the body of Christ. I've asked one more uh, set of people to come and join me, Carlos and Gabby, let's do it. These are my friends. I've, we've known each other for a couple years. These are, these are some awesome people. Carlos, Gabby, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about your family? Hi, everybody. Uh, Gabby and I have been married for almost 15 years. Um, most of you know our two little girls, Camila, who's 10. Isabella turns 8 tomorrow. Uh, we've been coming to MCC for close to five years, and it's been uh, an amazing experience. Amen. Awesome. Let me ask you guys, how have you guys found yourselves, we're talking about the whole home piece, how have you guys found yourselves at home in the body of Christ here at MCC? Well, when, when you asked us earlier you know, to, to participate in, in t today's, uh, uh, I, I started thinking, well, what does home mean to me? And this was last night, you know, crazy week. <laughs> and uh, to me, home is, um, my home is my haven. You know? Coming home, seeing my, my wife, my kids, they're my daily reminder of what a blessing is. It's where I come and just leave everything behind all the worries of, you know, the day's work and all the stress from the outside world. I come home. I feel welcome. I feel the unconditional love. So as I thought about answering this, you know, when we first got to, to MCC, coming from the, uh, the Catholic background, you know, it, we just felt very welcome. It was a, uh, I, I told my wife, I said, um, you know, we were, I was reluctant to come in here, but... I saw everybody worshiping. It was such a happy, non-ritualistic type of worship. Uh -huh. And I said, this is different. It was a good different, you know? Um, we felt welcome, friendly. Being young parents, we, uh, we want to give our kids, you know, the best upbringing that we can, we can do. And first and foremost is bringing them closer to God. Uh -huh. um, so as... Some, you know, they came here and after Sunday's class, they tell us what they learned and how they're, just the way they were thinking, the way their, their faith in God was growing. Uh, you know, we know we were off to a good start, you know, and um, the, the, the bonus was that as they learn, as their faith grew, so did ours. You know, I always thought of myself as a man of faith, but you know, a faith when needed, you know, praying when needed. And it was so much more than that. It's, it's you know, learning to find and see the blessings that are around you, even in the madness of your daily life, you know? So that, 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 was, that was the great thing. And, you know, all, all of a sudden, you know, we look forward to Sundays huh. coming to church. It wasn't, it wasn't a, we have to go to church. No, you know, we, we want to go to church. So it, it, it was great, you know, during difficult times. Um, some of, of you know about my dad's illness, um, our daughter's surgery. That's when you count on family to be with you, to support you, to pray with you. And we had so many people, you know, you normally hear, you know, I'll be praying for you. And it's, oh, that's nice. You know, but we actually know of people that were praying and we felt it. And, and this was just, you know, amazing, the power of heartfelt prayers, you know, how, how, blessed we are and and the results were you know my daughter's running around and she's perfect and my dad is still home with us and you know considering everything he's 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 good he he has a good life we've met great people you know built a great relationship with a, a lot of people Ernie and I he's become my uh, I call him my wise young brother um, but the biggest sign for me to know that we were in at home is my wife does the projector from time to time, and we come early. And one day, I, my kids, they took their shoes off and jackets on the floor and running around church. And here I am trying to catch up. And, you know, 
God, girls, what are you doing? You know, what do you think, you're home? And they both looked back and they said, yes. So, here That's we awesome. are. So, when Pastor Ernie came last week and he said, you know, I'm going to ask you this question. I started thinking of how do you put it into words, a feeling, you know? What, what does feeling at home mean and how do you, how, how do you put it into, how do you explain that feeling? And um, as much as I tried to come up with a, with, with a beautiful speech, I, I still didn't feel like it was like a, like a true meaning to what we, to what we felt. So I decided to ask my girls, because really it's usually the, the simplest answers that they give, the ones that are truly like the hit home, right? So I said, Isabella, how do you, how do you know that MCC is it's like our family, like our second family? And she goes, huh? I said, yeah, how do you explain that they, you know, we feel like at home there? She goes, because we love each other? And I said, oh, yeah, that makes sense, you know. That, <laughs> that's as that's simple awesome. as that. That, that, that's it. And then um, with Camilla, I said, you know, Cami, I was so glad I, um, I heard that you were really participating on the GEMS meeting that you had last week, and that's awesome. But what, what goes on at school that, it, that you can't, you know, be yourself there and, like, expose and, be, and participate as much? She was like, Mom, at church, they're not strangers. I said, oh, really? What's the difference? The teacher is not a stranger, you know, you, you see your teacher even more. She goes, no, at MCC they care about us, you know, so yeah. it's not, it's not, it's different. Like, like I was like, completely, oh, nice. like, how could you compare, you know? <laughs> so, it, 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 and it's true, it's true. When, when we started coming here, we found this beautiful community that just embrace you with whatever you have whatever you can, we, you can give. And um, we're here to, to bind with each other, to build upon our talents and our spiritual gifts. But we are broken souls looking to, to fight together, to Amen. walk this walk and, and just to Amen. find strength on, upon each other. So it's just a great feeling. Would you lead us in that, Marissa? This morning, the invitation is pretty simple, I think. And some of us have walked in here hopeless. Some of us have walked in here hurting spiritually, physically, emotionally. Some of us have walked in here a little alone. I want you to know that we can find rest and hope. There's hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ, isn't there? We can find rest and healing because there's healing in the name of Jesus. We can find rest in the body of Christ because we are welcomed home here. There's a, there's a song that we sing. Some of you probably think we oversing it. I don't care what you think, to be honest with you. <laughs> but uh, the other day, I was actually listening to them play this song live. I, I went to, to a conference to see Elevation Worship Live. And uh, yeah, it was pretty awesome. And uh, what I didn't realize was that this song, the, the, the verses are actually in the shape of a question. And uh, I sing it like it's a statement, but really it's a question. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do as we close, I know it's a little late. We're going to have burgers and hot dogs. We're excited for that. But I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes, bow your heads for a second. We're going to pray in just a moment. But I want to read these, these words. I'm just going to read them, William Shatner version. And, uh, and then Marissa's going to, going to sing it. And uh, I just want you to, as you sit there, answer these questions for yourself. Okay? Is that fair? The question is, are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? There's a hope. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Have life's circumstances left you weary, beaten, hurt? Have you laden, as the scripture says? Do you thirst from a drink, for a drink from the well? And there's a charge. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today. There's no, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows. You trade them for, for joy. And from the ashes, there's a new life that can be born. Jesus is calling you. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do in fact call us. You invite us to come. The, the door is open for us to receive rest and hope. Hope of the knowledge that Jesus, you died and rose again. A hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. God, we come today with the knowledge that we can receive healing in your name. Because there's power in the mere mention of your name. Father, this morning we receive your healing. Father, we commit this morning to find rest in the body of Christ. A group of imperfect people who, as we heard so eloquently, simply love each other to death. We really do. God, we can find rest in community. We don't have to do life alone. We can release the burdens of this life and be yoked to you. God, we thank you that your invitation is simple. Come and you'll give us rest. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Would you lead us in that, Marissa?